Greetings, Viceroys. Welcome to this Against the Storm Cornerstone tier list presented by Angry Pigeon. Today, we are going through all of the cornerstones in Against the Storm and rating them into one of the five tiers that you see on your screen, much like we did for buildings. And if you haven't yet seen the buildings tier list video, I would encourage you to check that out. Today, we are only going to discuss legendary cornerstones. We will go through epic cornerstones in another video. I want to start with legendary cornerstones because I think they're a little bit more fun. Some of them pop a little bit more. And they're a little bit more contentious. There's some legendary cornerstones that have very strong effects, but also some very negative effects on them. And I believe a lot of people have some favorites or some very firm opinions about these legendary cornerstones. We're going to get through them all today, and at the very end, I'll go through very briefly the rubric or the very vague criteria I use to rate these into tiers. But with that, let's get started. And I think it is worth noting that it is a bit more difficult to rate cornerstones than it is to rate buildings. With buildings, we can fall back on some mathematical calculations and compare them to other buildings a bit easier. Cornerstones, legendary cornerstones in particular, you only get three of these. On year two, four, and six, on years eight and ten, you're given an epic cornerstone. You will have seven epic cornerstones and three legendary cornerstones on year ten if you make it that far, and you don't get any more in the game after that. When you re-roll cornerstones, when you re-roll on a legendary year, 2, 4, and 6, you're only offered legendary cornerstones. If you re-roll on any other year, year, you're only offered epic cornerstones. So for that reason, I've separated out these tier lists into legendary and epic, and we will discuss them separately, starting with alarm bells. I, I'm going to go alphabetically, much like I did with the buildings tier list. Okay, here we go. Workers have a 15% higher chance of producing double yields when the hearth's expected corruption rate is 200% or higher. Alright, I do like global doubling chance. This is the same as the forum, but this doesn't even require that you have three people inside of a service building to take advantage of it, right? This looks good on paper, but I don't like this side effect, or, well, condition to be more accurate. You have to be at 200% corruption rate to make use of this. On years 3, 6, and 9, yes, you will spawn enough Blight Rot on the beginning of the clearance season to have 200% corruption, but you're going to clear that near the beginning of the storm anyways, so you're not going to be at 200% corruption except maybe during the clearance season and nothing else. And on other years, on year, years 1 and 2, you're unlikely to generate enough Blight Rot to trigger alarm bells. On years 5 and 4, maybe... I don't think this is act this is active long enough to be worthwhile. In general, I'm not at 200% corruption unless I really have a crazy good setup, which can happen if you get the right cornerstones, the right buildings, and some geysers or the advanced rain collector. Yeah, you can have a crazy setup with some blight and rain engines, but usually not. So alarm bells, this one is going to go. Let's type it in. This is going in the C tier, pretty low down. I don't really rate alarm bells. I think you can go without picking alarm bells most of the time. Okay, Ancient Pact, this is a lot better. The cost of knowledge can be very high. You can see the contents of undiscovered glades, but discovering dangerous or forbidden glades kills one villager. Oh, interesting. I Did this change? Because I felt like this used to be small glades as well, but it's only dangerous or forbidden glades that kills one villager. And killing a villager will get you half a hostility, or half a, an impatience point on Prestige 20 difficulty. This effect is very potent. This allows you to see the contents of glades. You can make very calculated decisions based on this. In my opinion, if there were a supercomputer that played against the storm, it would probably value this and Mist Piercers more than anything else. Because Ancient Pact and Mist Piercers are so game changing they allow you to calculate your way to the end game i think if, if you had something the likes of which plays chess that calculates many moves ahead if such a computer existed it would pick ancient pact every time every time it were offered ancient pact it would pick it i think this is pretty pretty good most people agree with this and killing off a villager if you get hidden from the queen or altar of decay or something like that you can actually turn this into a positive thing ancient pact is pretty darn good and for that reason ancient pact and this may not surprise too many people Ancient Pact is going in spot number four, and I'll talk about Mist Piercers right now as well, which is going into spot number three. In my mind, these cornerstones are essentially the same. I know they have a slightly different negative effect, but they provide the same value, which is showing you what is inside Glades, and I find that very important. You can scout out the Spirit Harmony Altar, you can scout out the Altar of Decay, you can look for 
glade events that you are able to solve. If you're on the marsh, you can use it to find that one specific forbidden glade that has your resource node in it. There's a lot of, the, the sky's the limit with these. I think um, you can almost always pick these and they're going to be valuable for you. I, I don't really care too much about the difference between Miss Piercers and Ancient Pact. I know Ancient Pact can combo with Hidden from the Queen. Sometimes you want to gain impatience though and Miss Piercers isn't terrible for that reason. Um, yeah, so I think you should pretty much always be drafting Ancient Pact and Miss Piercers when you see these. There are maybe a couple exceptions to that, but these are very strong cornerstones. Okay, moving on to Back to Nature. This is an ethereal cornerstone, which means that when you see it, your game is going to pause, and you won't be able to unpause your game before you pick this, or if you do unpause your game, you're going to lose this choice. Back to Nature is a contentious cornerstone, perhaps, because you lose all of your food when you pick this. This effect of doubling your farm production is quite powerful. However, you can get things like advanced herbalism, like every single farming building has a, an equivalent epic cornerstone that gives you 50% more output, which is quite a lot. You don't need 100% from back to nature. This is, I mean, you can make do just fine with the epic cornerstone, which is giving you 50% for your specific building. Back to nature is good though. This is quite potent. And I think a lot of people are afraid of this or maybe rate it very low. One theme I'm going to come back to quite a bit in this video is for things like Back to Nature, you can hoard food items in the field kitchen, you can hoard them in the makeshift post, anything that can consume certain raw food, you can store it there, even if you're not using it. And that's actually a good thing to do because if you encounter something like Back to Nature, you can pick this and all of your food, which is stored inside of the field kitchen, which is stored inside of the makeshift post, it's not going anywhere. So you can safely pick this and then relinquish all the food and kind of prevent the negative effect in that way. People should be preparing. When you open your cornerstone choice, think to yourself, like, am I ready for something like Back to Nature or Stormwalker Tax or those ethereal cornerstones? Like, can I pick one of those right now? Or should I prepare a little bit more before I open my cornerstone choices? Think about that. Back to Nature is pickable. I think I rated this one a little bit lower, but after getting a, a review in Discord, I decided to bump it up. I think this is pickable. This does actually provide a fairly powerful effect and increases your food supply, which is of course a good thing. So back to nature. Let's put it into its tier. Back to nature. This is going into the B tier. Pretty average. I think there are better choices. Like I said, because there is an epic cornerstone which does something very similar, I think this is a bit reduced in value. Um, however, back to nature, I think in general, we shouldn't be so afraid to pick this. Okay. Moving on to Baptism of Fire. This is not a contentious one. I think most everyone agrees this is a very strong cornerstone. Every three burnt blight rot cysts lowers hostility by minus 10. And the downside is when the hearth is corrupted, you're unable to sacrifice resources, which is a problem. That is a negative effect that I consider a little bit bad. You do want to be able to sacrifice. Sometimes you need to dip below three hostility just to evade the uh, blood flower spawning due to the, the rain forest mystery. Baptism of Fire is very good though. Minus 10 hostility. So think of it this way. You're going to be able to burn 30 blight rot cysts on year three, six, and nine total. So if you pick up Baptism of Fire on year two, you're going to get a hundred hostility reduction by the end of year nine just because of the blight rot that spawns naturally. Not to mention the blight rot that you spawn as part of rain engine usage. This has a lot of potential. Hostility reduction is something I rate very highly. Hostility reduction and global resolve stacks are something I rate very highly. Baptism of Fire is no exception. This is a very good cornerstone, and I think this opinion won't uh, surprise very many people. Let's put Baptism of Fire into its tier. And as always, I want you to think about, while I'm putting things into their tier, where would you rate this? Baptism of Fire, I put this in the S tier. I think most people would agree. Even people who play a little bit more conservatively see the value in hostility reduction typically. So in Baptism of Fire, you don't have to open glades or anything to get the benefit from this. You should pretty much always be getting it. Even if you pick this up on your six, it's totally fine. All right, we're gonna skip a few things. We're gonna talk about bone tools. We actually will talk a little bit about blood price contract and cannibalism because these are all sister cornerstones. Whenever a villager leaves or dies, you get a certain amount of resources. Bone tools gives you three tools. Blood Price Contract gives you 10 Amber, and Cannibalism gives you 30 Meat, and those two are epic cornerstones. Bone Tools is the only legendary here. This is interesting. What I like about Bone Tools is you, at the very end of the game, you could sacrifice a bunch of villagers by some means, just let them leave during the storm or something. If you let 10 villagers leave, that's 30 tools. You can open two medium caches with that. 
And if you need to stop the queen from being upset, you can just turn in a quest after you lose all those people. I think because you can use this as a game clincher, it's it's interesting and there's some things you can do with it. And of course, if you get hidden from the queen, it's okay. I did, and I will uh, give a shout out to Ron Empire. I asked him on stream because he picks these a lot more than I do. I asked him which of these does he like the best, and he said cannibalism. And I tend to agree with that. I think cannibalism because it prevents you from starving. And I did have a game where cannibalism helped me, uh, prevent prevented me from starving. So that was that was very nice. I think this this is pickable. It's not exactly my playstyle, and I think losing villagers is not usually something you're looking to do. So for that reason, I'm a little bit skeptical about bone tools, but I think this is this can provide a decent amount of value to you, and you can use it strategically. So bone tools, let's put it into its tier. Bone tools is also going in the B tier, a little bit higher up, and I want to note at this point that you'll see the A tier is actually the biggest tier. Legendary cornerstones are fairly fairly powerful powerful overall. And compared to the epic ones, where there's a lot of D-tier epic cornerstones, and, this, and the B-tier is actually the thickest tier, uh, with legendary cornerstones, you are kind of aiming to get something in the S or the A-tier, I would say, most of the time. Although some of these things in the B-tier are certainly pickable. And the C-tier, this is getting a little bit sketchy, but some of the things here are pickable, depending on your reroll or your, your, your current setup situation. We're going to skip a few things. Calming the Forest. What this one used to do is give you minus 50 hostility every time you solved two dangerous or forbidden glade events, which was great. I loved it. Now it's minus 40 every time you do an empathy solve. This is okay. I mean, hostility reduction, of course, is a good stat and you love to have it, but this is rather inconsistent. You can open a lot of glades and not get the empathy solve that you're looking for. And sometimes if you see an empathy solve, you won't be able to do it or it's not the one, not the solve you're looking to do. For that reason, calming the forest, if you get even one stack on this, it's okay. Like, minus 40 hostility is certainly all right. Uh, you're not terribly likely to get minus 80 on this. I, I think calming the forest is okay. Let's put it into its tier. Calming the forest. This is going in the B tier as well, above back to nature, below bone tools. Hostility reduction is a very good stat. If you're getting even minus 40 out of it, it's fine, but you're going to be dependent on luck to find the find the solves you're looking for in glades. I tend to open a lot of glades and I don't get too much value out of this. If you're a more passive player, you can probably skip calming the forest altogether. Okay, calming the water. Uh, this is another hostility reducing cornerstone. Hostility is reduced by minus 10 points every time you use 150 units of water in rain engines. And remember this because we're going to talk about counterfeit amber soon, which is 20 amber, I think, or 10 amber every 75 units of water used in rain engines. So calming water, this comes on a little bit slow. This is also hostility reduction, and I do like it for that reason. My issue with this is it's just kind of slow, and it is dependent on having a good rain pump setup. You can go quite a while without using 150 units of rainwater in rain engines in certain cases. And the limit, the sky on this is, I don't know, you're not going to get too much more than like minus 60 out of this, maybe, if you're having a really good game and you have you got this at the right time. I'm not terribly impressed by this, but since it does provide hostility reduction, it is going to be good for that reason. So call me water. Think of where you would put this one. going in the B tier right above Calming the Forest. I think it's actually fairly comparable to Calming the Forest. You're going to get just about the same, like minus 40 hostility maybe out of it. Um, calming Water is a little bit less luck dependent than Calming the Forest, so I do rate it slightly higher for that reason. Okay, let's keep this moving. On to, we talked about cannibalism a little bit. Cheap construction. All buildings cost 40% less, but every discovered resource node has five fewer charges. Cheap construction, this is a pretty game-breaking cornerstone. You can get by with just the crude workstation if you have cheap construction. This And this is retroactive. If you made three different camps, for instance, you could delete those three camps and remake them. You'll get the full refund in five parts on all three of those camps each. And you can rebuild them for three parts. This saves you planks, it saves you bricks, it saves you fabric, and it saves you parts. And maybe some other random things as well, like wildfire essence, which can be, can be useful for making a fourth hearth. Cheap construction is very good. You should very, very likely be picking this when you see it. There's very few things in the game better than cheap construction. So I may have given away a little bit where I'm going to put cheap construction. And it's going right here in the S tier, kind of in the middle of the S tier below, Ancient Pact. Very strong cornerstone um, because it provides just so much value in terms of building materials. And I don't really care about the negative effect at all. Making glades uh, have nodes which are slightly smaller. It doesn't matter a whole lot. So I'm, I'm typically totally happy to take cheap construction at any point in the game. It doesn't matter. All right. 
cooking steam, this is kind of a strange one. If for every 50 units of drizzle water you have stored, gain 10% cooking speed. And I guess with this, ideally, is you would have maybe 100 units of drizzle water stored and you would have 20% cooking speed, which is feasible. You could, you could certainly get there. The one thing I can say about cooking steam is maybe just make two rain collectors, gather 100 drizzle water, and then delete the rain collectors, and you can have it sitting around for cooking steam, even though you're not using it. The awkward thing with this cornerstone is if you are actively producing drizzle water, then you're going to consume it and then you're not going to be fully stacked on this. And I'm not typically upgrading my tank capacity and I don't like having to have the advanced rain collector in order to take advantage of this. Cooking steam is an interesting cornerstone, but I don't think it's particularly good. This is pickable in some cases if you want to be conservative with your rerolls, however. So cooking steam, let's put it into its tier. This is going at the very top of the C tier. I do pick this on occasion. It's just not very potent. Like what it's providing is kind of minimal. And I think you can go without picking cooking steam the vast majority of the time. Okay, copper extractor. Copper extractor, this is an interesting one. All crystal dew production is reduced by one, but for every five wood produced, gain one copper ore. This does add up to quite a bit of copper ore, and I do want to compare this to lumber tax. Lumber tax gives you one amber every 50 wood. This essentially gives you 10 copper ore every 50 wood. And I, I do believe 10 copper ore is more valuable than one amber. You can sell copper ore on trade routes, and it's worth a fair amount there. You can use it to make the best roads. Uh, you can use it to make pigment, if not copper bars. I do really enjoy having free copper, and I think you will get quite a bit out of this. Of course, if you're on the coral forest, I would almost never pick copper extractor. Even if you have foxes, this is somewhat pickable. Just the sheer value provides you in terms of copper ore. I do kind of like it. There are better legendary cornerstones out there, but this one is frequently good, if not very good. So copper extractor, where would you rate this one? Copper extractor is going into the B tier at the second position. I don't consider this quite worthy of being A tier. It can provide a lot of value to you. You can use this as your source of copper bars for tools but you're likely not going to get too much out of this on a map like the marsh and you want to be careful if you have foxes or some sort of crystal dew production already copper extractor is not going to be good for you moving on to counterfeit amber gain 10 amber every time you use 75 units of water and rain engines blight rot cysts grow 20 percent quicker when using rain engines firstly i do consider that a fairly negative advantage i know some people are saying but what about burnt to a crisp yeah if you have burnt to a crisp but then counterfeit amber is going to be amazing and you can use all those extra blight rot cysts. You can make a second blight post right away and you can be just cranking out blight and killing it and gaining a whole lot of amber and gaining a whole lot of, uh, you know, coal. Unfortunately, you're not always going to have burnt to a crisp. It's not terribly likely. So this is a negative effect. I, I don't like to have to fight blight rot. It costs you, it costs you time to produce purging fire. It costs you time, it costs you resources to make that purging fire. And there's always the risk of losing people. 10 amber every 75 units of water. And compare this to what we talked about before with calming water, which is uh, 10 hostility reduction every 150 units. So this is 20 amber equated to kind of minus 10 hostility. And I don't know if you can make that comparison directly, but in, in some ways I would almost rather have the amber. I think like the amber can provide you an immediate benefit. Sometimes you need this to open glades. But still, because this has a negative effect on it, which I consider kind of bad, and there are other ways to acquire amber through better cornerstones, I don't care too much for counterfeit amber. So let's put this one into its tier. Counterfeit amber is going at the bottom of the B tier. Oh, sorry, just kidding about that one. It's going at the second to last position on the B tier. We, I mentioned lumber tax just now anyways. So let's talk about lumber tax since I just revealed this one. Lumber tax provides you one amber for every 50 wood produced. I think that's very good on the Royal Woodlands and it's very good on, potentially on the Scarlet Orchard. If you're on the marsh or you're on the Coral Forest or you're on the Cursed Woodlands, Lumber tax isn't going to be as good for you. I think Lumber tax is okay, but there are better cornerstones out there for gaining amber. And I think Counterfeit Amber even is perhaps slightly better than Lumber Tax because Counterfeit Amber can provide quite a lot in the right circumstance. If you're on the Royal Woodlands, then definitely take Lumber Tax. If you're not on the Royal Woodlands, consider giving this one a skip. So that's the one that's actually the bottom of the B tier. All right. Let's move on. 
two crowded houses. All houses have room for one more villager. This is pretty simple. I do like this cornerstone a lot. Uh, I'm going to put it into its tier and then we'll talk about it. This is going in the A tier. It's our first A tier cornerstone. I really like this one. I originally had this in the S tier when I had both of the tier lists combined. But once I separated out the legendary tier, legendary tier from the epic tier, I think this one is good. It's just not game breaking like some of these S tier legendary cornerstones are. Having one extra person in your houses increases your luxury house size by 50%. That'll save you a lot of building materials. If you're operating with a crude workstation, then crowded houses will it kind of enable you a lot. It, where you were other, otherwise struggling on building materials. The only thing I can say about crowded houses that's kind of negative is I like to have exactly eight people at each hearth so I can upgrade them all to level one. And I prefer to have 24 people divided uh, among three hearths, so eight people at each one. When you have crowded houses, it's a little bit awkward to do that. You need to have nine people at a hearth if you're going to have three houses there. So it is a little bit awkward for that reason, but crowded houses is still a very good cornerstone. And I think perhaps underrated by some people. Very simple, but very good. Okay. Okay, that's an epic cornerstone. Deserted caravans. Global production is 50% faster, but trading is unavailable. I don't, I don't really like this. I think turning off trading is a pretty huge deal at any point in the game. There's really no point where I would be comfortable turning off trading. And 50% global production speed is not even that impressive. It is nice, but it's not going to break your game. It's certainly not as good as 50% global doubling chance. I think global production speed is not particularly great and losing your ability to trade. And I would say if this cornerstone did not have this negative effect on it, I would say it's probably high A tier, maybe low S tier. Um, but because it has this really devastating effect on it, I just can't see picking deserted caravans most of the time. And I'm fairly certain if you're playing on the bandit camp modifier, deserted caravans won't be offered to you. I've seen some people on forums wish that they could pick this when they were playing on the modifier where trading is already disabled. I don't think that's possible. And I'm pretty sure the game won't give you this choice if you are playing on the Bandit Camp modifier. So, okay, Deserted Caravans. Deserted Caravans is going at the top of the D tier. I, I think this is a D plus cornerstone. You can pick it in some cases, but it's really like you, you sort of have to have won the game in order to, in, in order to make advantage of this. I, I just can't see picking Deserted Caravans most of the time, seriously. So moving down to economic migration. So this is kind of a strange one. This gives you uh, more villager arrival speed. And so settlers arrive to your village uh, faster when you have stacks of this cornerstone. And to get stacks of this, you have to complete trade routes and get to levels of standing with other civilizations. For every two levels of standing, you get 15% quicker uh, arrival speed. There was a balance patch recently, which made newcomers, uh, the sizes of the caravans a bit more balanced. And I haven't fully seen the implications of that in action but in general i'm not struggling to get new villagers and you really shouldn't like i think if you don't lose any villagers there will reach a point you will reach a point rather quickly around year four or five where you kind of put the brakes on acquiring new people because you want to manage your hostility so i don't really care for economic migration and even worse this takes stacks before it finally comes into effect and you're not going to have those until later on in the game um because this provides a very weak effect and i, I don't see any see any use out of this really ever economic migration is pretty darn bad and economic migration i'm putting this one at the worst cornerstone in the game worst legendary cornerstone anyways i think it's i think it's really weak and you should probably never be picking economic migration we'll see how the new patch uh works when it comes to caravan sizes but i just can't see picking this all right exploration expedition this is a fun one. You get a minus five penalty to global resolve when you pick this, but you get a plus 15, a net plus 10, every time you open a glade for five minutes. I, I never used to pick this cornerstone. I was kind of intimidated by it. Uh, someone on stream advised me to pick it not too long ago, and I've picked it four times on stream since that point in time, and each game w went fairly well. I did have a somewhat sketchy game when I picked this on the Scarlet Orchard on year two, and year two is a bit early to pick e Exploration Expedition. You want this on year six, ideally, Exploration Expedition, it's better the larger your population because it's giving you, and, and global resolve stacks are that way in general. Because think of it this way, when you put a lizard in the blight post, you get plus five resolve to lizards, right? And if you have five lizards, you're going to get exactly a plus one. Five divided by five is one. Your lizard resolve is going to go up one when you put that lizard in the blight post. Now, if you have 15 lizards, you're going to go up only one third of a point when you put a lizard in the blight post. You need to put three lizards in the blight post to get your full global resolve, to get your full resolve point for lizards. 
I can have, or yeah, in global resolve points, sorry, global resolve points as provided by exploration expedition, those are better w when you have a larger population size because it's kind of like, you know, like when you have 15 lizards, this is kind of like putting three lizards on the blight post. It, when you think of it that way. So you want this on your six, but you can take it beforehand. Exploration Expedition is quite good. And I, I originally was hesitant about rating this one high. And uh, a reviewer who helped me on Discord, and thank you for that, um, told me he really values Exploration Expedition because this is a crushing amount of global resolve stacks. And I tend to agree, it is, it is kind of that way. If you're on year two and you're offered Exploration Expedition, you might give it a pass. But if you see this on year four or year six, odds are you probably want to pick it. So let's put Exploration Expedition into its tier. Exploration Expedition is going at the very top of the A tier. I like this one quite a lot. Generally, you want to pick this one. On year two, you might be able to give this one a pass because there's some unknown. And think of it this way, you could end up in a situation where you're opening a glade during the storm just to stay above water, and then you open a glade during the drizzle cycle to get your global resolve stacks up to get some reputation. You could end up opening two glades per season just to stay just to stay on top of things. If you're doing that, it might not be worth it. If you think you can survive the storm, then yeah, Exploration Expedition is pretty darn good. All right, let's move on to a much worse cornerstone. Oh wait, sorry, just kidding. First, we're gonna talk about Family Gratitude. Family Gratitude, you get 40 water skins for every full reputation point obtained through High Resolve. I really like this cornerstone. Some people seem to think this is mediocre or kind of whatever. You should almost always be gaining reputation through Resolve. In most games, I'm trying to get a point of reputation on year three, sometimes even before then, depending on what you have. If you have humans and beavers, it's going to be a bit more difficult to get points out of this. If you have foxes, it's going to be really easy. You're going to get a lot of reputation through Resolve for foxes. Family Gratitude. And water skins synergize with the beanery and with the granary for the pickled goods recipe. You, if Once you start producing pickled goods, you're likely to compound on yourself and get even more reputation through Resolve and get even more water skins. Family Gratitude can provide you quite a lot for that reason. Family Gratitude. Where would you put this one? Family Gratitude is going into the A tier right below Exploration Expedition. I, I value this one quite a bit, and some people don't see it, but you can get easily 240, 280 water skins out of this before the end of the game. The worst setup for this might be Human Beaver's Lizards, where you're not going to get as many reputation points through Resolve. But any other setup, I think Family Gratitude, you, you want to give this one a strong consideration. And even with Beaver's Lizards, if you can make the pickled goods from the water skins, they're going to be extra happy. So, I like this a lot. Pure, pure value cornerstone there. Okay, we have a few skips. Firekeeper's Prayer. Oh, wait, I did skip one. Oh, wait, they removed it. Oh, they removed it. Okay, it's gone. Extraction Tools is gone. No wonder I got confused. Interesting, so Extraction Tools is gone. Okay, well, we'll talk about that one, but I, I guess it's gone, so it doesn't matter. Firekeeper's Prayer. Glade event work speed is increased by 30%. Resources you sacrifice and burn 25% quicker. Now, I... I need to talk about the negative effect quick. I don't really care about this. When we talked about the temple in the buildings tier list video, I mentioned that I think the temple is a pretty bad building. And for exactly the opposite reason, I think this negative effect is not so bad. It's kind of okay. Typically when I'm sacrificing goods, it's only for a small period of time. If I lose a little bit of extra wood or a little bit of extra coal, it's, it's fine. It doesn't matter to me too much. On the other hand, I do value 30% glade work speed quite a lot. Keep in mind this applies to just about everything. It applies to haunted rain mills, it applies to glade events that you find, it applies to the archaeological discovery in the Scarlet Orchard, it applies to uh, encampments that you find, and I think random buildings as well. This, this actually helps quite a bit, and if you're going to open a glade, and some people say they like to play passively, I think you should try to expand your playstyle and be a bit more flexible. I do play maybe passively, maybe. I think I like to open more glades than a lot of people do. But sometimes I play passively. It really depends on the on the game and, and how I'm feeling. You want to keep this option open. And I think having Glade Event work speed, it really makes opening Glades a lot safer and a lot more reliable of a uh, of an avenue of play when you have this. It's like, imagine seeing the Fishman Cave and it kind of, before and after Firekeeper's Prayer, it's like this menacing thing. And now it's just, it just feels like a wet noodle. So yeah, Firekeeper's Prayer, I think this is really good. Although there is... A, an epic cornerstone prayer book, which is kind of comparable and maybe just as good, if not slightly better.
Barkeeper's Prayer. This is going in the S tier. In three, three, third spot from the bottom, I think you should pick Firekeeper's Prayer a lot. If you're a conservative player, you could potentially give this one a pass, but if you like opening glades even a little bit, Firekeeper's Prayer is the cornerstone for you. All right. Firelink Ritual. So this has to do with religion. The more wor uh, workers with religion that you have satisfied, it reduces the hostility level. 25 for every five villagers with religion satisfied. My problem with this is it's kind of a late game cornerstone. Typically you're not satisfying religion until later on in the game. And then when you do, you need a steady supply of incense, or this is just going to fall off and you're going to lose it. It's okay, I guess. Like, I think this is sometimes pickable. It's worth noting that this will only be offered to you if you have a way to consume religion. If you're playing with without humans and without lizards, then you won't be offered Firelink Ritual. So it will have some possibility. But I don't like this. I think it's just a little bit too little too late to really matter when you're playing the game. So Firelink Ritual. This is going to the C tier. Pretty low, actually. I think I would almost never pick Fire Lake Ritual. This comes on a bit too late, and I, I just can't see a situation where it's going to be a valuable pick most of the time. If you have incense delivery line, maybe, or just a huge stockpile of incense, like if you know you're going to be consuming incense, then yes. But otherwise, no. All right, Forge Strip Hammer. For Forge Strip Hammer, we're going to go flip over to the building section real quick just to show what this recipe actually is. Powerful and precise machinery. Parts, three star, can be produced in the smithy. So let's flip over to the build buildings and we're going to look at destroyed rainpunk foundry because this is from a glade event where you can where you can make destroyed rainpunk foundry. Oh, it's actually it's under rainpunk foundry, right? Go down to the uh, rainpunk foundry. So this is the recipe it's talking about. It's talking about uh, four copper bar or four crystal dew or 15 stone, 15 clay plus combustible equals one part. The issue with this recipe is it takes two minutes and 48 seconds to complete, which is really long. It, this is kind of slow. If you're looking for parts, there's better ways to acquire parts. I don't really care for uh, having this recipe. It is noteworthy that this is only offered to you if you have the smithy, so it, it won't waste your time by offering this to you when you don't have the smithy. But still, I would very rarely pick Forge Trip Hammer. There's Cornerstones, which we're going to talk about free samples next, which just give you parts. Why would I pick a Cornerstone that allows me to make parts in a very, very slow fashion? At a building which is already doing other important things. So Forge Strip Hammer, pretty much never picked this, I would say. This is going even lower than Firelink Ritual. Very close to the D tier, frankly. Forge Strip Hammer, just give this one a pass whenever you see it. If unless you're really starved for parts, I guess if you if you're really desperate for parts, you can pick Forge Strip Hammer. But there's other ways to conserve parts and uh, acquire them from quests or newcomers to, where you shouldn't need this. Okay, free samples. So we'll talk about this one. Gain one parts every time you sell goods worth 25 amber. How much do you value a part at? Like what, seven amber? Maybe? That's kind of what I would say. Uh, if you think of it this way, whenever you sell goods worth 25 amber, you're actually getting an additional seven amber. So you're getting maybe another 30% of the value of your sold goods back. So goods that you sell are now worth like 30% more If you, in terms of parts that you earn on this cornerstone in that sense. That's not strictly true because you know you have to reach the 25 amber threshold. This is kind of discrete, it's not continuous. But still, this does provide a decent amount of value. I used to never pick free samples, but I do like it now. Whenever I see this, I'm not too afraid to pick it. It's not a flashy cornerstone, but it, it does provide a steady amount of value. And parts are otherwise difficult to acquire. So because this just gives you free parts, and not to mention, once you reach level trade route level 3 with Civilizations, they'll start offering you some decent deals on parts. And once you get enough of these, you can kind of start putting them back out on trade routes. And when you get to that point, uh, you actually can gain quite a bit uh, of amber and this can kind of compound on itself and scale out of control. So free samples, I think this is a fairly good cornerstone. Maybe some people don't rate this one too much, but free samples. This is going to the B tier, right below copper extraction or copper extractor. Uh, I think you should give this one a try. If you're seeing this one versus some other choices, which are not typically great, free samples, this is, this is free value in, in a way. Um, it's not a lot, like it's not going to break the game like a lot of the S tier cornerstones are, and it's not like really great like some of the A tier cornerstones are, but this has no negative effect on it and it's pretty reasonable overall. And for the record, Extraction Tools was in the D tier. This is no longer in the game, it would appear, so we don't need to worry about it. This just gave you a very marginal amount of value for completing Glade events, but it was pretty pathetic, but it seems it's gone. Okay, next up we have Frequent Caravans. This gives a plus three to global resolve for 60 seconds every time you finish a trade route and the duration stacks. I do like this. I value global resolve stacks quite a bit. I understand this isn't permanent, but still getting 60 seconds of plus three global resolve can make a difference during the storm. It can really keep your head above water 
and it can help you get over the threshold for gaining reputation during the drizzle of clearance cycle. I like this quite a bit. It is dependent on trading, but this is no downside. It's just a nice steady amount of global resolve, which I do value pretty reasonably well. So let's rate Frequent Caravans. Frequent Caravans is going into the A tier right below Crowded Houses. Because this gives you global resolve stacks and there's no negative effect on it, I think this is overall pretty good. If you're not into trading so much, then probably don't pick Frequent Caravans, but you really should get into trading because there's a lot of great cornerstones that synergize with trading, and Frequent Caravans is a pretty good care, uh, cornerstone that synergizes with trading. We're going to skip a couple here from the ashes. Wait, this is new? An odd talisman made from talents of a phoenix gain one, one wildfire essence for every two completed dangerous or forbidden glade events. Oh, okay, so this is uh, what Expedition... You know what? I'm going to add this in at the very end, and I'll show where this goes in the tier list, and I'll take out Extraction Tools. But I've never seen this before. This is actually my first time seeing this. Gain one Wildfire Essence for every two completed Dangerous or Forbidden Glade events. Okay, how can we rate that? Well, Wildfire Essence is interesting because it can be used to make hearths. Three Wildfire Essence is enough to make a hearth. Typically, you have enough Wildfire Essence to make exactly two hearths, and that's it, so you'll have three total, counting your original one. You, you would need to complete three Dangerous Glade events just to get enough Wildfire Essence to do this. Like, how much do you value a Wildfire Essence at? If you're purchasing it from a vendor, it's, it's going to be fairly expensive. I don't know, I might value this similarly to a part. I might say, like, maybe six Amber, seven Amber, I, I would say is the value of a Wildfire Essence, if I had to assign it a value. And this is giving you one Wildfire Essence for every two completed events. So this gives effectively like three amber per completed event. That's not great. It, it's kind of mediocre if you think of it. There's not too many ways to acquire wildfire essence, but you can buy them from vendors. I don't think this is overall particularly good. And I think from the ashes, I'll officially put it into its tier list after as a kind of a footnote here. But I think this one is probably going into probably the low B tier, high C tier, if I had to guess. Okay. And I do have to guess. General Generous rations. Global resolve is increased by 5, but the chance of villagers consuming twice the amount of food during a break is increased by 50%. First things first, this isn't going to increase your food consumption by 50%, because when you play on Prestige 20 difficulty, you're already at a 50% chance to in, in, uh, consume double food. So your villagers will eat, on average, 1.5 food items when they go back on break. When you have this, they're going to eat 2 items on average. And what that means is your food consumption rate will go up by 33%, one third, instead of 50%. If you think this is going to increase your food consumption rate by 50%, that's not totally accurate. Five global resolve stacks is a lot. I think some people are very hesitant to take generous rations because starving to death is a real concern in this game. You don't want it to happen. This could accelerate you if you have a food problem already. It could accelerate you into a, an even bigger problem. However, I think if you're picking this on year four or six and you have a reasonably sturdy food supply, generous rations is very good. Five global resolve stacks is a lot. And I think once you start making complex food, your villagers may end up eating more anyways, because if you have multiple complex food items available, they might eat multiple complex food items. I need to confirm that. Somebody on uh, Twitch told me that that is how it works, that if you've got three food items available that your lizard may want to eat, they'll eat all three of them. I need to check that, but regardless, this isn't such a huge issue when once you get onto year four, year six, once you have a secure food supply, five global resolve stacks is really comparable to something like Rebellious Spirit. Generous Rations is okay. It's pretty good. Let's rate it. This is going at the bottom of the A tier. I think Generous Rations is okay. I do like this cornerstone. Be cautious with this. You don't want to starve to death. If you have cannibalism, of course, there's some synergy there. People are hesitant about picking this. I think people should take it more often. If you're seeing this on year two, maybe don't pick it. If you're seeing this on year four, year six, like anything else, like Exploration Expedition, for instance, this benefits you more the larger your village is. So if you get this on year four, year six, it's going to be much better for you. Okay. Moving on, we have a couple skips here. A lot of skips. We're going to talk about Hidden from the Queen, and I want to provide a footnote on this one as well. Maybe I'll, I'll do a slight addendum after the video, because my opinion on this has actually changed. The crown doesn't need to know everything, and patience doesn't grow when villagers leave or die. I, I used to rate this as a B-tier cornerstone, because it doesn't provide you any value, and I still stand by that argument uh, against this 
cornerstone, which is it doesn't provide you anything. It just prevents you from gaining impatience when you lose people. And I typically try not to lose people. I feel partly that you shouldn't be losing people if you're playing properly. And that's not totally true. You will lose people and you can actually intentionally sacrifice people in, in some cases. Hidden from the Queen does open up some levels of play, some avenues of play that otherwise would not be possible without it. And this can provide a good security blanket if you're losing the game. It will prevent you from losing the game, potentially, if you have like a particularly bad storm. And villagers are fairly easy to recuperate. Caravans tend to come fairly often. You'll have more villagers than you need most of the time. You can, you can lose some villagers. Hidden from the Queen, this is a very good cornerstone overall. Let's put it into its tier, and I think it, it will stay in the same tier regardless of whether I update this or not. This is an A tier cornerstone, fairly in the middle of the A tier. I might bump this up a couple slots. Most everyone who plays against the Storm uh, tends to pick Hidden from the Queen, and I think if you do pick this frequently, you're doing something right. I, I've read before people say that it's hard to lose the game when you have Hidden from the Queen, and that's probably true. That's probably true. I think this does enable you in a lot of ways. If you're a new player, you can uh, pick this, you can prioritize this, it'll, it'll help you. If you're an advanced player, you can also pick this and combo this with the Altar of Decay and the um, Forsaken Altar, things like that. This, this cornerstone, it, it, is, it is quite useful, even though it doesn't provide you direct value. And because it doesn't provide you direct value, I have a hard time putting it into the S tier. And there are some occasions where you do want to gain impatience, and Hidden from the Queen is uh, somewhat negative in those circumstances where you do actually want to gain some impatience. All right. Uh, Hunter-gatherers. This is maybe another contentious one. All camp production is increased by 100%, but all buildings that use fertile soil are decreased by 50%. Think of this in terms of workers. When you have fertile soil, you can make multiple farms. You could have three farms working in the same patch of fertile soil if you really want to. Um, so this isn't going to decrease your maximum amount of crops per fertile soil patch. It's going to decrease. It just means you have to put out more workers to compensate. And if you're leaning into camp production, if you're on the marsh, for instance, this could be very good. If you're on the marsh, I would maybe consider giving this a pick. I used to rate this in the C tier, and I did bump it up because my reviewer in Discord said this is a pretty good cornerstone and he picks it. So I think hunter-gatherers is maybe something people should be a little bit less afraid to pick. Think of it this way. If you have four people gathering and you've got two farmers, you're effectively gaining four gatherers by picking this, and you're effectively losing one farmer by picking this. So you would need maybe to put out two more farmers to to have the same effect that you had before. This is this is pretty potent. Um, if you're playing on the Cursed Woodlands or the Scarlet Orchard, I would probably not pick this, but on any of the other maps, I think this is, this is viable. Just pick it with caution. Hunter-gatherers, let's put it into its tier. This is going in the B tier. I do have a hard time rating this one higher because it's not, I, I consider, I, I would probably never pick this on, like I said, two biomes. But since it is good on the marsh, potentially, and the marsh is the hardest biome, hunter-gatherers is a something to keep in mind. I think this can actually provide you quite a bit of value when you're in a, a situation where you don't have that much fertile soil. Improvised tools. Woodcutters are tasked with craft, uh, creating makeshift tools. Discovering a glade during the storm grants 10 tools. This is pretty nice. 10 tools is approximately 30 amber in value. There's some um, nice synergy here with opening glades, of course. If you see something like the Fishman Cave, well, that takes tools to solve it. So maybe you just generated an out for that glade event that you just opened up. This is nice. The one thing to watch out for here is there is a forest mystery, which gives you, if you open a glade during the storm, it gives you a minus 10 resolve penalty for three minutes. And that's one of my least favorites. It always gets me. If you have improvised tools, it may be a little bit difficult for you with that forest mystery to make use of this. I do like this. The other limiting factor with uh, improvised tools, of course, is you need to open glades. If you're stuck in a situation where you can't really open glades safely because of hostility concerns, or you don't like to play aggressively, then this isn't going to do a whole lot for you. Nonetheless, I think 10 tools for opening a glade is pretty darn good. Let's rate improvised tools. Improvised tools. This is going in the B tier, or sorry, the A tier, just above generous rations, kind of at the bottom, like an A minus almost, but I, because this provides 30 amber of value almost for opening glades during the storm, I like it. You just have to be careful. You're not always going to be able to open glades and you're not always going to be able to open glades during the storm and tools, well, they may not actually help you anyway. So keep that in mind. All right, and by that I mean not every glade event is solvable with tools. So if you're counting on the tools to solve the glade event, that might not be good enough. Lost Supplies. 
An unusual amount of supplies can be found in some glades. Gain 40 meat and 40 grain for every completed dangerous or forbidden glade event. I, I, my most... The, the most standout cornerstone I can relate this one to is Old Fedora Hat. Because Old Fedora Hat gives you more good more things for solving glade events and for solving more than just glade events. Because this is uh, dangerous or forbidden glade events only. And 40 meat, 40 grain, it's okay. This will prevent you from starving, maybe. But this doesn't add up to a whole lot of meat or a whole lot of grain by the end of the game. You may only get two more glade events or three by the time you pick Lost Supplies. I think there's there's better cornerstones out there. This one is not really changing the game for you in a, in a huge way. It's just okay. This does help you if you're having trouble with food. And of course, grain can be turned into, and meat can also be turned into complex food. So, Lost Supplies, this is okay. Lost Supplies is going at the top of the B tier, actually. I, I consider this to be all right. It's, it's providing some amount of value, just not a whole lot. And because it prevents you from starving, I think that's why it stands out compared to some other B tier cornerstones. Lumber Tax. Gain one amber for every 50 wood produced. I, I rate this cornerstone okay. If you're playing on the Royal Woodlands, of course, I think Lumber Tax is going to be pretty darn good. Otherwise, you may not want to pick it. We already revealed Lumber Tax. It's going here at the bottom of the B tier. Um, the reason for that is if you're playing on the marsh or you're playing on the Coral Forest, for instance, I think Lumber Tax is pretty bad. If you're playing on the Royal Woodlands, this is good. That's one of the easier biomes, though. And I would probably, I don't know, I might pick this on the Cursed Woodlands, maybe, depending on the situation, but maybe I, I would give a strong consideration to something else anyways. When you stack this up against something like Bed and Breakfast, I think Lumber Tax is not providing a whole lot of amber. And Counterfeit Amber, similarly, it, it's providing more amber, just has a negative effect on it. If you want amber, I think Stormwalker Tax is, is a better cornerstone, and Bed and Breakfast is a better cornerstone. And there's a couple Trade Route cornerstones as well that are potential that give you uh, amber and keep in mind this is a legendary cornerstone there's a few epic cornerstones as well that provide amber for different things so lumber tax i think this is for a legendary cornerstone a little bit underwhelming and probably again if you're on the royal woodlands go ahead and pick this but otherwise maybe give it a pass okay miss piercers we already talked about uh but each discovered glade increases the queen's impatience. So this actually does affect small glades as well as uh, dangerous and forbidden glades. But even still, I think this is... I think that doesn't really change my calculus too much. I think Mist Piercers is still very, very strong. Maybe Ancient Pact is slightly better, but they're essentially the same. All right. Mushroom Seedlings. This is a strange one. All farms can plant mushrooms two-star on farm fields during drizzle season. So this doesn't apply to something like the clay pit, of course. This does, I, I believe this does apply to the forester's hut. This is interesting because mushrooms are a pretty good resource. You can turn these into pickled goods. You can turn this into flour. But if you have the small farm, and of course you can eat these directly. If you have the small farm, I probably wouldn't take this, or at least very rarely. You can already make flour with the grain, and this also makes porridge. But if you have the small farm or the herb garden, that doesn't matter. I don't really care for this too much. I think you can pick it in many cases, or it's not many cases, but some cases, when you need that six raw food or it fills in some gap in your food chain, then yeah, okay. But let's let's rate this one. Okay, near the top of the C tier. I do pick this one on occasion. It is interesting. But if you have the small farm, I would probably really strongly consider not taking this. And I, I, we just kind of flipped past over moldy grain seeds, which is an epic cornerstone that gives you mushrooms for producing grain, which I like quite a bit. And that's an epic one. Mushroom seedlings, you can probably pass this one up the majority of the time. There are some occasions where it will be good for you, though. No quality control. Gain plus two to wood production. After each storm, all stored wood is removed and you gain 50 insects. So think of it this way, there's 12 minutes in one year. So 50 divided by 12, that's approximately four. That's approximately four insects per minute, which is really good. You, you see those perks that give you three per minute or five per minute or something. Four insects per minute is actually quite a lot. Um, th this is very powerful and gaining plus two to wood production, also very good. If you're playing on a map like the marsh or the coral forest, this is going to give you a huge amount of value. It's going to really uh, improve your fuel supply. You may not need a coal mine in that case. 
you do lose all your wood, which is fine because you can store it. You can sequester it in the blight post, in the crude workstation, in anything that makes planks. There's quite a few options for storing up your fuel or storing up your wood before no quality control is going to trigger. And by the way, if your woodcutter camps are full of wood and ready to deliver, that wood is not affected. If they're ready to deliver wood, then that, that's totally fine. So no quality control. And I don't think this is too contentious. I think a lot of people value this cornerstone pretty reasonably well. This is going into the bottom of the S tier. I think maybe pick a little bit of caution because on the Royal Woodlands, you might not want this. This is going to make your wood cutting a little bit slower overall because you are going to gain a lot more wood, which means you're going to spend more time transporting that wood to and from the warehouse. And for that reason, you may pick this with caution on the Royal Woodlands or the Scarlet Orchard because there's a lot of trees on there and it may make it more difficult to open glades. Nonetheless, no quality control, very good. I think most people in the community agree that this is a pretty great cornerstone because it provides you two very good things, extra wood and extra food. Hard to go wrong with no quality control. And even on the Royal Woodlands, you can pick this and just kind of settle down and not plan on opening very many glades. Just be, uh, be mindful of your woodcutter's time. Old Fedora Hat. Okay, so what this does is plus 50% chance of receiving double goods from glade events. This is pretty good. I think most people don't pick Old Fedora Hat or they don't think about it. Um, I think a lot of people are slightly confused by this, so they pass it up. Or they, they fancy themselves a conservative player. They don't open very many glades. That's fine. Uh, Old Fedora Hat, I, I, this really does apply to a lot of things. If you're opening, if you're solving dangerous glade events, uh, forbidden glade events, if you're solving um, things like uh, abandoned encampments, you know, or not abandoned, encampments that have people in them, if you're getting amber out of that, then Old Fedora Hat will give you 50% more amber on, on average when you're solving those encampments. And caches as well. If you're opening caches, this will give you bonus amber. This will give you bonus goods from caches. Not bonus reputation, but it will give you bonus amber. For that reason, Old Fedora Hat really does apply to a lot of situations. If you have caches sitting around, like this will help you. This, this can add up to quite a bit of amber and quite a bit of goods. Even, and if you're a conservative player, maybe don't take Old Fedora Hat, but if you like opening glades like I do, Old Fedora Hat is pretty darn good. You will get a, just a lot of raw value out of this. So let's rate Old Fedora Hat. Old Fedora Hat is going right below frequent caravans. I think this just provides so much in terms of raw value. It's, it's kind of hard to go wrong with it, but if you're not going to open very many glades, then keep that in mind. All right, over diligent woodworkers. Some woodworkers just can't stop working, gain three barrels for every 10 planks produced. I like this, barrels are good. Of course, producing ale gets an even extra bonus for having barrels on hand. Three barrels for every 10 planks. This isn't going to add up to a whole lot usually. And this is kind of in a weird situation where if you have something like the lumber mill, you're going to produce a lot of planks. And if you have a lot of planks, it's easier to make barrels. So this sort of helps you, the, it get, provides the most barrels in, in a situation where you already have maybe some means to make barrels. Even still, I do like this. You're almost always going to be producing planks at every stage of the game, usually. And if you have good plank production, this is just even better. Free barrels, I like this quite a bit. Over diligent woodworkers is uh, fairly nice. Let's put it into its tier. And I named it to over diligent work. I, I named it over diligent workers, not woodworkers here. This is going in the low A tier. Pretty much a safe pick, like I said, because you will be or should be producing planks at every part of the game and you always have the means to do so, you will get barrels from this. Barrels are very nice. You can use this for pickled goods. You almost always want a container source on hand and over diligent workers helps quite a lot. Not as good as family gratitude. Family gratitude should give you a lot more containers than over diligent workers. Over exploitation. Newly discovered resource nodes have more charges, plus 10 charges to small deposits, plus 40 charges to large deposits, but you gain 10 hostility upon picking this cornerstone. This is actually a plus 30 hostility. I believe on Viceroy difficulty and above, this is going to be plus 30 hostility, which is the same as a, a Dangerous Glade, which is quite a lot. I don't like to pick this cornerstone very much because if you're picking it on year two, maybe you haven't opened very many glades yet, which is nice, but you're still gaining 30 hostility and you don't know what your hostility situation is going to be like when you get into the late game. And if you pick this on year six, maybe you've already opened a fair number of glades and you're not planning on opening too many more. Uh, or in like having extra charges on the glades you do open doesn't really matter so much at that point. I don't really like this. I think over exploitation, the negative effect on this is simply too much. 
I value like 30 hostility reduction reasonably well. The fact this is giving you plus 30 hostility and the effect on it is kind of mediocre. I, when I rated over exploitation the first time, I in intuitively put it where I think it belongs, and that hasn't changed in any of the reviews I've done. It's kind of stayed in the same place. Let's check it out. Over exploitation is going at the very bottom of the C tier, borderline D tier cornerstone. I think you could go without picking this the vast majority of the time. The hostility increase is simply too negative of an effect for you to be picking this frequently. And these are some good cornerstones, but they're epic, so we won't talk about them. All right, we can talk about both of these at the same time. Prosperous settlement and protected trade, these are similar. When you sell goods on trade routes or sell goods to merchants, you gain stacks on this. Every 40 amber, you get plus one to global resolve for prosperous settlement. Protected trade is the same thing, but minus 15 hostility for every 25 amber. Okay, and if you think of it this way, when you sell 200 amber on trade routes or to merchants, this will give you a minus 120 hostility, and this will give you plus five to global resolve. So which is more important, minus 120 to hostility or plus five to global resolve? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, those are both very important stats. Overall, I think I, I rate protected trade better because hostility reduction is slightly harder to come by, and it can really save you. And keep in mind, like minus 120 hostility is potentially like six points during the storm, uh, like six equivalent to six resolve points during the storm. And it can spare you from negative effects, which are devastating. I like this quite a lot. Um, Prosper Settlement, of course, also very good. These are like, you know, exhibit A and exhibit B of why you should be doing trade routes. There's simply a lot of great cornerstones that synergize with trade routes. And when you're offered these, you can make a lot of good use out of them if you're planning on doing trading. And I think making provisions, having provisions is, is just very valuable for this reason. So let's, let's put these into their tier. I don't think this will surprise too many people. Oops. All right. We revealed that one a little bit too soon. That's okay. We'll talk about that one very soon. Uh, protected trade, prosperous settlement, both going into the S tier. I think protected trade is slightly better. And I, I do rate this one slightly better than baptism of fire because this doesn't have a negative effect on it where bat baptism of fire prevents you from sacrificing, which has gotten me into a couple odd, uh, awkward situations in the past. Safe Haven. We'll talk about this one when we, when we get there, but S tier, um, obviously a very good cornerstone because this also is providing hostility reduction. Anything which provides hostility reduction in a reliable format is going to be pretty pretty high up. And I think most people in the community tend to agree with that. Queen's Gift, a mysterious amber orb with a magical flame trapped within increases the ancient heart's resistance by 50 for every impatience point you have. I don't really care for this so much. This is, you can compare this to uh, Firekeeper's Armor, which gives you 50, recovers 50 points of corruption every time you destroy a Blight Rot Cyst. So Queen's Gift is kind of giving you 50 hit points for every impatience point you have. Firekeeper's Armor is recovering 50 hit points every time you burn a Blight Rot Cyst. I actually kind of like that one better. And this one is dependent on having impatience. I think the year you're most vulnerable is most likely year three when you may be struggling to get your Blight Post constructed on time, struggling to find enough bricks. Queen's Gift isn't going to help you too much on year three. I think this, and for a legendary cornerstone, this is like epic cornerstone power level. I don't like Queen's Gift. This is something you can do without the vast majority of the time. Let's rate it. And I will type this one in. This is going in the C tier above Firelink Ritual. Generally avoid this. I think it's marginal. You can pick it. There are some situations where you just uh, need a little bit more security when it comes to Blight Rot. And in that case, you can pick Queen's Gift, but typically this isn't providing enough for you. All right. Rebellious Spirit. The people are feeling oddly rebellious. Gain plus one global resolve for every two impatience points. This is going in the S tier all the way at the very top. Uh, this, if I made an S plus tier, I think Rebellious Spirit might likely stand alone as the only S plus tier cornerstone. This thing is truly crushing. It caps out at seven stacks when you're at max impatience. And even in the early game, you can get up to a plus one global resolve from this really quickly. And plus one global resolve is nothing to sneeze at in the early game. I really like this Rebellious Spirit. It, it's pretty much always pick this cornerstone. Just, just always pick it. There's really, I, I can't think of a situation where I would not pick Rebellious Spirit. It's simply too good. And not to mention it's a, a lose less cornerstone. If the queen is upset and you're at risk of losing the game, that's when Rebellious Spirit gives you its biggest advantage. So Rebellious Spirit, uh, this is a purely great cornerstone. It's very, very strong. Almost always take this. I, I can't think of any, any, any reason not to take this. 
Okay. We have a couple skips here. Rich Glades. Newly discovered resource nodes have plus five for small deposits, plus 20 for large deposits. You'll notice this is like not quite as good as overexploitation, but unlike overexploitation, this doesn't have the 30 hostility penalty on it. And for that reason, Rich Glades is better. This is still a fairly underwhelming effect. You can make good use out of this, but typically this is kind of mediocre. There's there's better, better cornerstones out there. I, I don't really care for it. And most people tend to lean into farming anyways. I, um, Rich Glades, let's rate it. This is going to the B tier, fairly low down. It is better than over-exploitation. However, since most people are relying on farming, and I think there's simply better ways of acquiring better, more resources from nodes, Rich Glades is simply not there for an epic cornerstone, or for a legendary cornerstone. You can take this. I do rate this B tier since it's kind of steady as it goes and it will always provide you some sort of value, regardless of the map or your setup or, or anything like that. But typically, there's going to be a better choice than Rich Glades. All right, Rudy Ground. Strange roots spread across the land. Wood production is increased by one. Harvesting and planting crops are 25% slower. Think of, this is another cornerstone that you need to think of it this way. If you have three people farming and they're now working 25% slower, you can have four people working 25% slower. And that's the same thing as having three people working. So if you had three farmers, now you need to assign another farmer. So you need a fourth farmer. However, if you had six woodcutters, maybe you only need three woodcutters now because you're getting double wood from this plus one wood production. So in that sense, if you had six woodcutters and three farmers, you would be getting two more workers, net workers freed up by picking this cornerstone and still getting the same amount of wood and food from your trees and from your farmland. This is okay if you think of it that way. If you're really relying on fertile soil a lot, like if you have two patches of fertile soil and you've got like six farmers out there, I would say maybe don't pick this, but if you're going with one patch of fertile soil, eh, you can kind of take this. And especially if you're on the marsh or the coral forest, this can be the difference between running out of fuel or needing a coal mine and just having enough wood where it's not a problem. It is possible to be very tight on wood on certain on certain biomes, especially the more difficult biomes. So for that reason, Rudy Ground, I used to rate this one a bit lower and my reviewer convinced me otherwise. I think this is a bit higher. I still don't rate it terribly high, but I think Rudy Ground does have a place when you think of it that way that I just mentioned. This is going in the B tier above Rich Glades, below Hunter Gatherers. You can pick this. I think Rudy Ground does provide uh, something on those maps where you're light on fuel and you need a source of fuel. All right. Royal Guard training. The Crown sends two Royal Guards. Yeah, flavor text. Gain two. Uh, whenever you attack a traitor, you get two extra impatience points. That's a negative effect here, but you get plus five to resolve for being under the effects of brawling. This applies to foxes and lizards. It's worth noting that this will only be offered to you if you have foxes or lizards. And foxes and lizards are, are nice because they give you reputation at a fairly high rate, better than humans and beavers do. And that's why Vineyard Town is kind of kind of bad in some ways, because beavers just don't give you very much resolve. This negative effect, first of all, it's not bad. Getting two extra impatience points for attacking a trader. I almost never attack traders anyways. But even if you do, typically people attack traders when they're already capped out on impatience. So they attack the trader and then take a lot of goods and then they turn in some quests to make the queen happy. This, so this doesn't really matter. That negative effect, it's fine. Getting plus five to global resolve for being under the effects of uh, brawling. That is, that is fairly nice. I do like this. I think I'm going to move this one down slightly from where I have it. So keep that in mind. It may, it, I don't think it'll go down all the way to another tier, but I think I'm probably going to move it to the bottom of its tier or close to that. This is, this is okay. I think plus five to global resolve for additional plus five to resolve for being under the effects of brawling is pretty good, especially considering it's foxes and lizards. So let's rate it. This is going in the B tier. I think I will move this one down very slightly. Like maybe, yeah, this is, this is nice. And like I said, it is guaranteed to be of some use to you gaining all that extra resolve and the the negative effect it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter at all safe haven i already revealed this one this is s tier minus 40 to hostility for every hearth upgraded to neighborhood level two i typically upgrade my hearths to level one beforehand i get three hearths and I upgrade them all to level one and i get the plus six global resolve that way and then i'll start upgrading them to level two but if i have safe haven i'll probably just make two hearths and upgrade them to level two right away uh, before making a third hearth safe haven of course getting minus 40 hostility reduction is great Getting minus 80 hostility reduction is excellent. And you can even sometimes get up to minus 120 hostility reduction here by the end of the game. I think safe haven, um, a lot of potential, very great cornerstone. 
Uh, we'll, we'll, let's flip back over to the screen real quick. You can take a look at it. Safe Haven is in the S tier, very high up. Because this is, you don't even really need to open Glades to take advantage from this. It's just always there for you. And more, and I think it's just probably the most reliable hostility reducing cornerstone in the game. And for that reason, I rate this one very highly. All right. We have a couple skips here. And we'll talk about small distillery very briefly. This cornerstone is only offered on the Royal Woodlands. If you're on any of the other biomes, it's not offered to you. And for that reason, it's okay. You're never going to be offered this unless you have a steady source of resin. Because on the Royal Woodlands, you have a steady source of resin. And you will get a fair amount of crystal dew for this reason. I, I had this cornerstone once on the Royal Woodlands when I had the Forester's Hut as well. And that was really crazy. I just made a ton of resin and I got extra, way more crystal dew from it as well. It was pretty lucrative. Small distillery, fairly good cornerstone. You, when you see this, you can almost always pick, take it, and it's a fairly decent pick because it's only available on the Royal Woodlands. Small distillery is going in the A tier. It's not the most impressive cornerstone, but anything that gives you free crystal dew is nothing to, nothing to scoff at. You will get quite a bit of value out of this. Smuggler's Visit. I used to think this was the best cornerstone in the game. A shady but lucrative character appears in your settlement. You can choose one blueprint from all unlocked blueprints. This is a fairly high skill cap cornerstone, of course. Like obviously, you're going to have information overload when you're looking at, or you know, analysis paralysis when you're looking at 50 different buildings or so, and trying to decide which one you want to draft. And you need to make the right choice. It's possible you'll end up making a mediocre choice, but this is this is very good. The sky's the limit. You can pick that building that you need precisely based on what resources you have or the gap in your supply chain. Or something that'll make one specific species very happy that's perfect for your setup you know like if you have beavers uh harpies humans you can take the forum for instance this thing is really good pretty much always take the take this i would say i i did have a game on the marsh where i was offered smugglers visit and mist piercers and i ended up taking smugglers visit and taking the herbalist camp and that worked out for me because i was able to open a forbidden glade and get to the proto mushroom so and and, and harvest it so smugglers visit is very good you need to know what you're doing when you take this, but I think Smuggler's Visit, especially on P20 difficulty when blueprints are kind of scarce and you're not just being thrown as many options as you are on lower difficulties, Smuggler's Visit is very good. And I'm, I'm always happy to see this one. So perhaps not surprising to anyone, Smuggler's Visit is going to round out our S tier. Quick recap of the S tier, we have Rebellious Spirit, Smuggler's Visit, Mist Piercers, Ancient Pact, Cheap Construction, Safe Haven, Protect and Trade, Baptism of Fire, Firekeeper's Prayer, Prosperous Settlement, No Quality Control. And I think this this is fairly accurate. I may shuffle this order around slightly in the future, but I think as far as S tier cornerstones go, these are very game breaking in their own way. They provide just a huge amount of value and have the potential to scale out of control in many cases. Smuggler's Visit doesn't really scale out of control, but it, it since it provides a very specific niche that you can fill. Stormwalker Tax. A joint venture with the Stormwalker Guild can be very profitable. You'll gain 15 amber every time a new group of villagers arrive, but you lose all stored amber upon picking this cornerstone. So this is one of those ethereal cornerstones. When you pick this, you lose all amber. And if you, you can't unpause the game while you're being offered this, or else this option will disappear. Again, this is one of those times where you, you really want to preempt the fact that Stormwalker tax may show up as one of your choices. You want to have a merchant in town. Because if you have Zorg in town, for instance, and you have 30 amber, you can just dump all that amber on Zorg and buy some stuff, even if it's not the best. You can buy it, and then you can pick Stormwalker tax, and you don't lose any amber. Then it, you lose all your amber, but you had zero to begin with, so it doesn't matter. I think Stormwalker tax is pretty good. As far as cornerstones that give you amber, this is a fairly reliable one. You'll tend to get quite a bit of amber out of this. If you see Stormwalker tax on year six, I would probably not pick it. But if you get this on year two or four, it's generally going to be enough amber, and especially on year two you can make a lot of use out of Stormwalker tax. This is going in the A tier, right above Hidden from the Queen. Because this provides some value in Amber, I do think it's slightly better than Hidden from the Queen. But still, Stormwalker tax will provide you potentially 60 Amber if you get this early enough, maybe 75. Um, there, there is quite a bit of Amber that you can gain from picking this cornerstone. And raw Amber is a very useful resource to have. Survivor Bonding. I used to rate this one a bit higher. The people in your settlement have survived many hardships, plus 10 villager speed, plus one global resolve. The issue with this cornerstone is plus 10 villager speed. H how do we rate that? And if I had to say, if I had to convert this into global resolve stacks or compare it against global resolve, I would say 10% villager move speed is maybe as good as a fifth of a global resolve point. It's, it's okay. 
I, I think global movement speed is not as good of a stat as I originally thought it was. There are some cases where it's good, but typically with your workers, you want them to be kind of in the area where they're working and you want to be mindful of where they are and not have them move across the map very often. If you have uh, move speed, it of course, will make certain plays easier. It'll make uh, opening glades easier. It's not terrible. 10% villager move speed is okay, but global resolve stacks are simply better. But this cornerstone, which just provides you one global resolve stack and 10 villager speed, this is nice. And villager speed is somewhat hard to come by otherwise. So this is a fairly good cornerstone overall. It's just not game breaking. Okay, survivor bonding is going in the A tier. Fairly high up. I think one global resolve stack and 10% move speed, no questions asked, is rather good. And this is almost always a safe pick. Fairly good. It's not going to break your game, but you can, really can't go wrong with this. Okay. We have a few more skips here. Trade hub. This may be a contentious one. This is a difficult cornerstone to use. The settlement is known as a trading hub in the region. Gain one reputation point every time you sell goods worth 60 amber while slowing the reputation gain from resolve by 50%. So what this does is whenever you sell 60 amber worth of goods, you gain a victory point. Wow. But you, the reputation you gain from resolve is from your species is 50% slower. And some proponents of this cornerstone will argue that this doesn't impact the threshold at all. So Harpies will still be at 15, you know, the threshold for Harpies will still be at 15 reputation, or 15 resolve, sorry, until they gain one reputation point. And for that reason, some people think that this cornerstone is actually not very negative at all. Like the negative effect is really not so bad because it doesn't mean the threshold goes up faster. I disagree. I think that if you have foxes or Harpies, you should be gaining like six rep per game from foxes. Maybe, like that happens to me frequently, and this will impact the amount of reputation you gain from your foxes. If you're playing with humans, beavers, lizards, or humans, beavers in general, then Trade Hub is a lot more pickable because humans and beavers don't generate that much reputation. If you had to set up like lizards, foxes, harpies, I would consider not picking Trade Hub. I did pick this in a game on stream recently, and I did very well with it. I got like seven rep points out of it. This is very potent. It can be an out to the game, so Trade Hub is a pretty good cornerstone for that reason. And this is another example of why you really should be trading because there's so many cornerstones that are good that synergize with trading. So trade hub. This is going in the A tier. Above small distillery, below hidden from the queen. Pick trade hub with caution. If you see this on, I think ideally you'd pick this on your six maybe, but you're probably not going to gain too much, rep, too much reputation before your six anyways. Uh, yeah, so ideally pick this later in the game like your six, but... Trade Hub is totally fine to pick, potentially year four, year six. And of course, only if you're trading. If you're not trading, then don't bother picking that. Urban planning. For every 10 completed trade routes, all houses will have room for one more person. This is not as good as crowded houses. I don't care for this as much. And the reason for that is you're not likely going to get two stacks out of this. It takes quite a while to complete 20 trade routes. By the time you complete 20 trade routes, the game is like almost over. So, and especially, you know, you have to do it after taking urban planning. This is not retroactive. I much prefer crowded houses. This just kind of comes on too slow and then potentially upsets your house, your delicate housing alignment. Like, you know, how many people you have at each hearth. It could upset that when it ticks over a threshold. So I don't care for urban planning too much. I think this cornerstone is a bit weak. Just stick to crowded houses and don't take urban planning so much. Urban planning. This is going in the C tier right below mushroom seedlings. I do, I really don't care for this. I think it's, it's like I said, it comes on a bit too slow and it can be awkward when it finally does tick over to something like two stacks. Just avoid it. Okay, we only have five left and I will do some three very brief exercises at the end of this video to see if you've been paying attention. Let's get on to these last five. Without restrictions, villagers have a 10% chance of receiving bonus yields from production, but consumption control is disabled. And we are going to see a very similar cornerstone in workers' rations, which also gives you a 10% higher chance of doubling your production. And the drawback on this one is 20% higher chance of consuming twice as much food during a break. So let's discuss both of these without, restriction, without restrictions and workers' rations. I do like both of these cornerstones pretty well. Anything that gives you a 10% global doubling chance, which is always active, of course, that's going to be a very nice effect. I, I value that quite heavily. That's the uh, same benefit you get from having a level two hearth. And this effect, 20% higher chance of consuming twice as much food during a break, I don't really mind so much. I think you will actually generate about that much more food 
just in your food pipeline, be it from harvesting, farming, and using the field kitchen or whatever, that 10% doubling chance is going to get you more food. And keep in mind also, this isn't going to increase your food consumption rate by 20%. It's actually going to be closer to like 12 or 13% increase from what your previous consumption was when you before picking the talent. I think this is, this is quite good, and, and, and it doesn't have very many drawbacks. Without restrictions, this is a little different. So this disables consumption control, which is annoying. I find on like the Cursed Woodlands, for instance, you may not want to do this because some of the ghosts ask you to disable certain consumption control items for your villagers, and you may not be able to do that if you pick without restrictions. However, 10% global doubling chance is good, and some guy on stream actually kind of corrected me when I said, like, oh, this effect doesn't matter, it's fine, the losing production control. He's like, but wait a minute, you like consumption control, and I do. I think consumption control is, is of course, a very good tool to have if you know what you're doing. Um, but still, 10% chance of receiving bonus yields, I rate this rather highly, and typically with the consumption control, ideally, I don't want to be toggling things off anyway. It's like, you can just let things be as they are. And one thing you can do if you don't want your villagers eating raw food, for instance, you can hoard that raw food in the field kitchen, in different places, uh, just anywhere except the warehouse, and force them to eat like porridge, for instance, uh, if you want them to eat porridge instead that way. So there's ways to work around this. If you are unable to mess with consumption control, you can still get the same effect by doing some similar things. All right. Let's see, where do you think without restrictions and workers' rations are going? Well, we've got workers' rations coming in very high in the A tier, and also, without restrictions, not too far behind, high up in the A tier. Anything giving you a 10% global doubling chance is a very strong consideration. I think because these have marginal negative effects on them, they're not as good as they otherwise would be, but it's not bad enough that I think this is a, a gimped cornerstone by any means. I think it's the, these both of these workers' rations and without restrictions are very, very good. Strong A tier cornerstones. All right. Woodcutter's Prayer. And we have three more. Uh, woodcutter's Prayer, plus one to wood production, lose all stored fuel upon picking this cornerstone. Of course, this is a, a fairly bad negative effect. If you don't have any fuel, your hearth is going to run out. And you start the game with 28 coal. Just losing your 28 coal right at the beginning is not great. I like to have that coal in reserve in case I need it for the hearth or for a glade event solve. Sometimes you need to burn down something like the Rain Spirit Totem if you have no other better way to solve it and you need 15 coal to do that, your starting 28 coal will get you most of the way to two such solves, which is nice. When you pick Woodcutter's Prayer, you're going to lose all of your coal. What we should be doing as players is anticipating the situation better and storing, sequestering that coal, all that wood, inside of the blight post, inside of the field kitchen, inside of the crude workstation. So when you see something like Woodcutter's Prayer, you can pick it, and then you won't lose all of your fuel, and you'll have some stored up in buildings, and you can just relinquish that and use that instead of being completely dead on fuel. Of course, Woodcutter's Prayer, this is nice. This is the same effect as Rudy Ground, essentially, where if you had six workers not doing woodcutting, now you really only need three. If you're on the marsh or the coral forest, I would say this is a very strong consideration because you're going to be a little bit light on wood on those two biomes. If you're on some other biome, in the Cursed Woodlands too, to a certain extent. If you're on the Scarlet Orchard or the Royal Woodlands, you might not need this, but in general, this is a fairly decent pick. Let's go ahead and reveal it, even though I think we all know where this one is going. Woodcutter's Prayer. This is going to go in the B tier. A little bit high up. I do rate this one better than Rudy Ground since this does not have any permanent negative effect. And I think if we were all playing better, we would anticipate seeing this and potentially not suffer the negative effect very much at all. If you could sequester that 28 coal inside of different buildings and only lose your wood, then the, the negative effect on Woodcutter's Prayer is not so bad. Woodpecker technique, gain two insects every time woodcutters cut down a tree during the storm. Think of it this way, it takes two cuts to chop down a tree, and this gives you one insect per chop, effectively, on average. What you can do, is, if you're really into microing, is you can micro your tree chopping so that going into the storm you have a whole bunch of trees which are only one chop away from going down. Now that's going to take a lot of effort to micro that much, but you could do it if you're really crazy. Having 100% bonus chance to get an insect from cutting down a tree during the storm, that is very nice. I do rate woodpecker technique. Anything that's giving you food is, of course, going to be very good. The main issue with woodpecker technique is you might not be able to run woodcutters during the storm, or you may not be able to run very many woodcutters during the storm. Even still, I think you're going to get a fairly significant amount of insects out of this if you do it right. If you have uh, woodcutting camps close to warehouses and you're optimizing your woodcutter as well, this can get you quite a lot of insects during the storm. So woodpecker technique, 
and I think it's probably obvious where this one is going. A tier or C tier. Yep, Woodpecker Technique is going right here into the A tier, a little bit low down, because like I said, it does come with the issue that you may not be able to run too many woodcutters, but anything that's giving you such a large amount of food is worthy of a consideration. And finally, of course, we have Work Safety Guide. Let's take a look at Work Safety Guide. This is every five villagers with a need for education fulfilled will increase global production speed by 25%. This is even worse than Firelink Ritual. Firelink Ritual at least is applying hostility reduction. This is like temporary production speed for your, for having education solved. This is only going to happen later in the game. I wouldn't want to pick this on year two or four because it's just too early and you don't know if you're going to have that education consumption by then, usually. Even on year six, this is a bit suspicious. And it does go in the C tier. I think this is occasionally pickable if you have like a lot of scrolls. If you have if you are consuming scrolls, you can get value out of this. It's just very situational, and I don't value the global production speed all that much either. So work safety guide is going to round out our C tier. And that is the full tier list. I think uh, the one, that's that's it. I think Lumber Tax could maybe go a little bit higher and maybe Hidden from the Queen could go a little bit higher. Those are the two things I'm, I'm thinking of updating here. But in general, I feel pretty good about the overall placements into tiers. And I think Legendary Cornerstones are rather powerful on the whole. And if you're looking at a C or D tier Cornerstone choice, you may want to consider re-rolling that. And on the topic of re-rolling, let's do a couple exercises here. Choose a Cornerstone, Alarm Bells or Copper Extractor. Well, Alarm Bells, if you'll recall, is in the C tier. Copper Extractor is in the B tier. This is a situation, and, I, I, and I'm not showing what year it is or any other context. I want you to think about that. But I would say, in this case, probably pick Copper Extractor. But this is a case where if you have three rerolls, this, this is a situation you may want to reroll. If you're on the Coral Forest, I would probably reroll this for sure. Alarm Bells is maybe pickable if you have like a significant amount of Blight Rot production going on. But... Probably a reroll here, most likely. All right. Next choice. Ancient Pact or Family Gratitude? Yeah. Um, I think both of these are potentially pickable. I would probably spring for Ancient Pact, most likely. That would be like an 80-20 pick for me here. Maybe slightly more than 80% bias towards Ancient Pact. I do think Family Gratitude is, of course, a very strong cornerstone. Lots of value. You could pick it here. Almost certainly don't reroll this. One of these is, is guaranteed to be very good for you either way. I really can't see a situation where I would consider a reroll here. All right, last choice, Counterfeit Amber or Stormwalker Tax. Yeah, Counterfeit Amber is B tier, of course. Stormwalker Tax is A tier. You could consider rerolling here if you're in a situation where you're going to lose a lot of Amber when you pick Stormwalker Tax. Like if this is year six, for instance, I would very strongly consider rerolling. If this were year two or four, I would consider taking Stormwalker Tax. And ideally, you're going to be able to drop all of your Amber if you're able to pick Stormwalker Tax relatively safely, safely, like you have less than 15 Amber right now, then Stormwalker Tax is probably what I would pick here. But if it is year six or you have a lot of Amber, probably reroll in this situation. Even if I had like two rerolls or one reroll, I would consider doing a reroll in that situation. So, yep, those are the quick exercises. Cornerstone rubric, and just to flash this on the screen, I'm not going to talk too much about this. this these are kind of vague categories for how things are, are placed, but... Um, a tier, it may provide a strong benefit with a, with a cost. B tier, it provides a good benefit with a cost or a situational benefit. C tier has a high cost or only provides value in certain situations. So that's the state of that's the state of the tier list that I'm trying to adhere to. And one last thing, I did update this tier list one final time to move lumber tax up slightly. I think it is a little bit better than I had it previously. And I removed the extraction tools cornerstone and I added uh, from the ashes into the C tier, right here in the middle of the C tier. I think this is pretty weak. It's doing the same thing that Extraction Tools is doing. It just provides you something slightly better, but I, I still think it's not enough. One Wildfire Essence for every two Glade Solves is just, it's a little bit weak. Something like the Old Fedora Hat is going to be a lot more valuable for you. So probably don't take from the ashes very frequently is my take on it. All right, and that's it. That's all I got for this video. I will do the epic cornerstone tier list not too long from now. I have that ready to go. I think it's slightly more boring than the legendary cornerstone tier list is, and it's a little bit harder to rate some of the epic cornerstones. I think there's just a lot more chaff, a lot more bloat in the epic cornerstone list. These ones tend to pop a little bit more. 
and they're more exciting for that reason. Uh, once again, thank you to my reviewer on Discord. Thank you to you for watching. I do want to respond to questions. Somebody asked about the spreadsheet for the buildings tier list, and I need to update that. There was a couple changes to the game, and I need to like just double check a couple things on there. Like for instance, actually, pack of building all the pack of materials were made more valuable recently, which is hilarious because I was saying that they were already so valuable before that update. So there you have it. This is the legendary cornerstone tier list. I'm Angry Pigeon. Find me on Twitch. Find me on Discord under Angry P. And yeah, that's it.